The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chairs are authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled Assessing the Impact of FASB's Current Expected Credit Loss, or CECL, Accounting Standards on Financial Institutions and the Economy. Before we begin today, I'd like to thank the witnesses for appearing today. I appreciate your participation. And we, uh, I think, anticipate votes around 4 o'clock, so hopefully if we can get done before then, it'd be great. If not, we'll uh, hope that you'll be able to be held over until uh, after we get back, which probably won't be too long. I don't think we've got too long a session today, maybe in 45 minutes to an hour or so. Uh, we'll see how it works out. But again, uh, just give everybody a heads up. I now recognize myself for four minutes for the purposes of delivering an opening statement. There has been much conversation over how to best calculate expected credit losses for financial firms. That conversation has taken place at the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, and financial institutions of all sizes across the nation. It's also been discussed in the halls of Congress. Several months ago, I co-hosted a roundtable discussion with several members of the Financial Services Committee, regulators, and stakeholders to discuss FASB's Current Expected Credit Loss, or CECL, standard FASB leadership later commented to the press that the meeting had been contentious. That was an accurate statement. The meeting was contentious because this is an important issue and one that could have serious implications for our economy. It deserves our full attention. The final CECL standard set to be implemented in the coming years represents, in my judgment, the most significant accounting change to the banking industry in decades. Under this new standard, institutions will recognize the expected lifetime losses at the time a loan or other financial product is recorded. This rule has been done under the guise of investor protection. It applies to every single financial institution in the, in the nation, regardless of whether they are publicly traded or privately held. If the purpose of CECL is to protect shareholders, it's my opinion that private firms, particularly community banks, should be exempt from this rule altogether. For publicly traded firms, FASB should amend the final rule so that it appropriately takes into consideration existing bank capital regimes which already require institutions to owe capital against expected losses. Ultimately, we need a rule and enforcement mechanism that reflects the realities of banking. We also need processes in place that offer greater clarity and collaboration. Since our roundtable, FASB has indicated a willingness to work with Congress and with stakeholders to make changes to the final standard. Some of the suggestions will be highlighted today by our panelists. I hope FASB's willingness is sincere, and I encourage the board to take into account any and all alternative proposals discussed. Also, I want to encourage the federal financial regulators to consider the dramatic challenges that will result from implementation of the standard and to have their examiners exercise pragmatism and sensibility as banks and credit unions work toward compliance. We have a very distinguished panel of witnesses with us today, and we thank them for appearing. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Missouri, uh, Mr. Clay, for an opening statement of five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and in the interest of brevity, uh, knowing that we will face votes sometime during this hearing on the floor, I'm going to defer my opening statement to my good friend from uh, California, Mr. Chairman. I yield to him. I thank uh, the ranking member both for the time to make an opening statement and for the opportunity to participate in this uh, subcommittee. Wherever on Capitol Hill there's a discussion of accounting theory, I am certain to be there uh, as chair or co-chair of the CPA caucus. Uh, FASB is a government entity. If you violate its rules, you go to jail. It is the most powerful government entity double insulated from the public. Uh, that is to say, the SEC, we've delegated power to the SEC, which then delegates power to FASB. The, by comparison, the Fed is a populist organization. The Fed comes here to discuss their policies far more often than FASB. And uh, the fact is that what FASB does is more important than well over half of the government entities that are subject to the Administrative Procedure Act. We need to see FASB follow, uh, provide quantitative impact studies and field testing before they turn the economy on its head or any sector of the economy on its head. Now this is an area where this is an anomaly from an accounting perspective. They're going to turn to banks and say, the day you make a loan that you think is a good loan, you've lost money. 
Um, that's crazy. If it were true, you wouldn't make the loan. Um, but the idea that you incur a loss when you make a loan, you're going to make 100 loans, hopefully in my district. I guarantee on a couple of them, especially you loan to some people I'd otherwise tell you about, you're going to lose money on maybe two of them. You're going to make money on 98 of them. You don't recognize the profit on day one. You shouldn't recognize the loss on day one. It is a portfolio of loans with profit and loss built in it. But I'm told by FASB that it is important that you have higher reserves, that in the years before the economic uh, recession, that banks were not, did not have, were not booking adequate reserves. Now, it would think it would be the bank regulators that would decide whether you need more reserves. Um, and they can simply allocate, take a portion of your capital on the right side of your balance sheet and say, keep that money available because we could have an economic downturn. In fact, requiring you to have sufficient capital um, is uh, their main job. The other way to increase your reserves is to take one of your assets and subtract something from it in order to force you to have more reserves. Um, if you need more reserves, that would be a good thing. But put aside the balance sheet, because we have to understand that what drives public companies is the income statement. And for us to tell banks, if you loan $100 million to small businesses, you incur a loss when you do it right, when you have good underwriting standards. But if you invest in a $100 million bond portfolio of publicly traded bonds, and you say, we're not going to hold these bonds to maturity, most people don't, then you can invest $100 million without incurring a loss. Every day there is a struggle for capital between Main Street and Wall Street, between those who get money from banks by issuing a bond and those who have to come beseeching you for a loan. And we should not allow FASB to adopt a standard which biases you against uh, Main Street and in favor of Wall Street. That being said, I'm sure that if FASB goes back to the drawing boards on this, They'll figure out a way to make sure that there are adequate reserves without imposing a, uh, a, a, a something on you that reduces your earnings per share because uh, that is what will drive your behavior. And if you are told that, and I, I realize this all in the eventually, if you've been in business long enough, this uh, c can come out in the wash. Uh, what you did two years ago moves in one direction, what you're doing now. But anytime we turn to a bank and say, make a good loan to a small business, that means you have lower earnings per share, uh, that's a bad day. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. With that, uh, before I turn to him for opening remarks, I'd like to recognize the distinguished gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mrs. Rothfuss, the vice chair of the subcommittee. Mr. Rothfuss has been a tireless advocate for economic freedom and growth. He's been a valued member of this committee and he would be missed. So with that, um, Chair now recognizes the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, the gentleman from, Mr., uh, from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss, for one minute and an opening statement. I want to thank the Chairman for calling today's hearing on the potential impacts of CECL. Uh, this Congress, we have made significant progress, bipartisan progress, right-sizing the regulations on our financial sector. These reforms have strengthened our financial institutions and made them more responsive to consumer needs. An important principle supporting this effort is that we need to consider the cost and benefits of any major change, whether we are looking at new regulation or a change in gap. With implementation looming in the distance, CECL has come up in many of my discussions with bankers throughout Western Pennsylvania. Both large and small institutions are concerned about implementation and the potential impacts that this new approach may have on the way they do business. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses what effects they anticipate from the implementation of CECL and whether further study or adjustments may be necessary. With that, I yield back to the chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Today we welcome the testimony of Mr. Joe Stephen, Chief Executive Officer of Stephen Capital Advisors. Mr. Bill Nelson, Executive Vice Pres President and Chief Economist for the Bank Policy Institute. Mr. Scott Blakely, uh, Chief Financial Officer, Capital One Financial Corporation, and Mark Zandi, Chief Economist, Moody's Analytics. 
Each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Without objection, each of your written statements will be made part of the record. And before we begin, we need to have a little housekeeping here. We have, uh, because of the, the content of this and discussion points of this committee, uh, we have a, a number of members of the financial, full financial services committee who are not members of the subcommittee who would like to be here today. So in order for them to, to participate, we need to recognize them. Uh, without objection, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, are permitted to participate in today's subcommittee hearing. While not members of the subcommittee, they are members of the full financial service committee, and we appreciate their participation. With that, uh, we begin the uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stephen, you're recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Okay, you need to hit the button on, the, on your microphone. And I would ask each of you to pull those little boxes toward you. Uh, they do come toward you. Uh, this is not the best acoustics in the world here. So if you just act like you're going to take a bite out of the microphone, it works really well that we can actually hear you that way. So uh, I do appreciate that. If you, the closer you get the, the, to the microphone, the better it is. Okay, Mr. Steven, you'll recognize for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Steven, and I am honored and sincerely appreciate the opportunity to share my personal views and opinions on the scheduled topic. I have analyzed the financial industry and financial institutions for 35 years. Early in my career, I was an analyst examiner in banking supervision and regulation at the Federal Reserve Bank, St. Louis. From there, I went to Stiefel Nicholas for 20 years. I founded and was director of financial institutions research. During my tenure, we completed over 250 transactions for financial institutions. Most recently, 13 years ago, I started my own company, an SEC registered private investment advisory firm focusing on financial institutions. In January 2012, in addition to my CEO responsibilities, I was appointed by then FASB Chairman Seedman as a member of the Investors Technical Advisory Committee. It was a four-year non-compensated appointment, and the FASB expected us to thoroughly analyze and discuss current and proposed accounting rules, including CECL. After a year, approximately, I was invited by the FASB chairman and the board to become co-chair of the IAC. In April 2015, the IAC issued a comment letter on Cecil. I'd like to read to you a short excerpt from the summary paragraph on page two. Currently, IAC members have wide-ranging views on the proposed Cecil model. However, a majority view the proposed model as needing improvements on topics listed in the body of this letter under points of general concern. These points addressed, one, process and implementation, two, lifetime losses accrued day one, and three, IFRS convergence. I've been asked to discuss the impact of this accounting standard, what it will have on financial institutions, including the effect on the availability and affordability of credit for your constituents, U.S. consumers, and the burden on financial institutions. Let me get started. The burden on financial institutions, primarily banks, is much more than readily apparent. Instead of me giving you my opinion, let me give you an actual example. One of my seven references is David Kemper, executive chairman of Commerce Bank, a great regional bank with 150-year roots. Commerce never took a penny of TARP, and they came through the 2007-2009 Great Recession in excellent shape. I know this for a fact, because I've been a customer of that bank for over 25 years. They came through the toughest period in nearly a century, and they had to go out and hire a third party to do their Cecil modeling. This shows you the complexity of this model. I can give you other names of other great companies with similar experiences, like Texas-based Prosperity Bankers. Again, no TARP, CEO David Zalman. If you add these implementation costs to the wide-ranging estimates from third-party experts for the reserve build, it could cost $20 billion, $50 billion, some say 100 
But don't stop there. What is the impact on customers and consumers and the availability of credit? If a loan equals about 10 times each dollar of equity, the simple math amounts to about $500 billion, a half trillion of potentially less lending. So let me ask you, do you think that hurts availability? The answer is obvious. Will this lower long-term financing if lenders have to look out lifetime? Does this push people out of the banking industry into non-bank lenders? Will the rates that these other lenders, subprime companies, payday lenders, will their rates be more than what banks charge? How many billions are going to be wasted on unproductive modeling as none of this modeling, none of it, changes the actual result? In my view, this model definitely will impact the availability of credit for consumers. Furthermore, there are other negative consequences that absolutely <clears throat> need to be discussed in my Q&A. Thank you. I got four seconds. <laughs> well done, Mr. Stephen. We appreciate timeliness around here. Uh, I didn't explain the timing mechanism. There's a green means go, yellow means you got a minute, to, minute left, and red means we need to call it quits. Uh, Mr. Nelson, you're recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Chairman, ranking member, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Bill Nelson, Chief Economist of the Bank Policy Institute. Prior to my current role, I was Deputy Director of the Division of Monetary Affairs at the Federal Reserve Board, where I worked for 23 years. At the Federal Reserve, I was extensively engaged in developing our emergency liquidity programs during the crisis and helping to strengthen the liquidity and other elements of our regulatory framework afterward. I'm here today to discuss BPI's research, which demonstrates that the proposed new accounting methodology, current expected credit loss, or CECL, is in fact procyclical. That is, CECL will amplify swings both up and down in the economy. During the financial crisis, banks were following accounting rules still currently in place called the incurred loss methodology for credit losses. Under this approach, a bank takes a provision, that is, it recognizes credit losses, which are then subtracted from capital when a loss is both probable and estimable. Through the crisis, domestic and international banking agencies were frustrated by how slowly banks were provisioning for losses on loans. So in the aftermath of the financial crisis, and with a goal of reducing procyclicality in the financial system, FASB published a new methodology, CECL. Under CECL, banks must provision for all losses expected over the entire life of the loan when they first book the loan. As an illustrative example, if a bank projects the loss rate on a five-year home equity loan to be 2% per year, it will book an immediate loss equal to 10% of the loan amount when it makes such a loan. For each subsequent period, the bank would take new provisions, positive or negative, as it changes its economic outlook and receives information about the performance of the loan. It is undisputed that lending standards deteriorated in the years preceding the crisis, and so a requirement that banks take losses based on a more forward-looking perspective would seem likely to increase provisioning during the go-go years, thereby diminishing the enthusiasm for baking bad loans and leaving banks better prepared for the subsequent fallout. Indeed, early studies of CECL concluded it would be countercyclical as intended. However, we have all learned a lot about projecting loan losses over the past decade, in part due to stress testing. In particular, loan losses depend importantly on the state of the economy, in addition to lending standards. As a result, understanding the cyclical properties of CECL requires determining how the economic projections banks will utilize evolve over the cycle. Unfortunately, early studies simply assumed that banks could predict with perfect foresight the state of the economy. This proved to be a critical mistake. By contrast, my colleague Francisco Covas and I used real-time projections of the economy combined with models of loan losses developed by the New York Fed to estimate what level of loan loss allowances Cecil would have called for in the years before, during, and after the financial crisis. Because economic projections almost never anticipate turning points in the business cycle, economists tend to revive outlooks down as the economy slows and up when the economy picks up. By our estimates, Cecil-based loan and lease loss allowances as a percent of bank loans would have risen only about one half percentage point in 2005 and 2006 as lending standards deteriorated, but three and a half percentage points in 2007 and 2008 as the economy collapsed. Had Cecil been in place during the financial crisis, 
we estimate that banks' capital ratios would have been one and one and a half percentage points lower in the third quarter of 2008. Those lower capital ratios would have reduced bank credit supply in the crisis by an additional 9 percent, significantly worsening the recession. These results support our conclusion that Cecil is indeed procyclical. Cecil loan loss accounting will not only be procyclical, it will also disproportionately affect home mortgages, student loans, small business loans, and loans to households with less than pristine credit histories. For example, Cecil would require a bank to book an immediate loss of $1,500 when originating a typical $2,500,000 mortgage in good times, and a $15,000 loss when originating the same loan in bad times, a tenfold increase. Such a requirement would reduce banks' willingness to make such loans in times of stress. While FASB followed a rigorous process around the proposal, we believe that, given our findings, more economic analysis is required to understand better the downside risks of implementing this new standard and incorporating it into regulatory capital. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and to present our research. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Mr. Blackley, you're recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Chairman Lukemeyer, Ranking Member Clay, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Scott Blackley, and I am the Chief Financial Officer of Capital One Financial Corporation. Capital One is a diversified bank that offers a broad array of financial products and services to consumers, small businesses, and commercial clients. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify before the subcommittee about the FASB's new accounting standard, commonly referred to as CECL. I applaud the FASB's desire to address the criticisms of the current accounting for loan losses. Unfortunately, I believe that CECL will create significant unintended consequences that will be harmful to the availability, accessibility, and affordability of credit for consumers and small businesses. During an economic downturn, this will be particularly felt by those in underserved segments of the market. What is it about CECL that leads us to believe these outcomes are likely? Today, banks book credit losses on loans when those loans are probable and estimable based on conditions that exist at that moment, including where we are in the economic cycle. We record revenue on good loans and we recognize losses on those that turn bad. Under CECL, companies will be required to recognize all future estimated losses on loans before recognizing any revenue. Let me offer an example. If a bank originates a mortgage loan and the borrower makes payments for 10 years before encountering some unfortunate financial difficulty, the bank will generate revenue and capital during those years before the loan goes bad. Under Cecil, the bank would recognize all expected future loan losses when the loan is originated and before even the first dollar of revenue is recognized, reducing bank capital immediately. This accounting distorts the economics of lending, and it disadvantages lending to those with less than perfect credit. This is because the higher the perceived risk of a loan, the higher the upfront loss we must book. It stands to reason that during a recession, banks will be less likely to lend when CECL requires that we reduce our capital for losses that could occur years into the future and before we've generated even a dollar of revenue. Another issue is that in practice, Cecil will be highly procyclical. Having overseen the loan loss allowance at financial institutions for over a decade, I believe I have a good perspective to offer about what the future under Cecil will look like. Prior to an economic downturn, allowances will be based on economic forecast, heavily influenced by the then current environment. As an economic downturn evolves, forecasters will increasingly incorporate worsening economic assumptions, which will drive up Cecil allowances and reduce lending capacity. Further, I believe there will be a strong bias from auditors and regulators to expect banks to build allowances assuming economic worsening until there's evidence of economic improvement. This process will likely result in the peak loss allowance occurring after the peak of the economic worsening. As bank increase reserves, the nat this naturally reduces the level of capital available to lend. Under Cecil, banks will be further limited in their ability to lend during an economic downturn, which is damaging not only to consumers and small businesses, but also to the economy more broadly. As we saw during the global financial crisis, constrained credit significantly amplifies the impacts of an economic downturn. In conclusion, we must ask, is it wise to go forward with an accounting rule that distorts the economics of lending and has the potential to constrain lending in an economic downturn? Capital levels, 
not allowance increases, are the appropriate way to address credit loss uncertainty. And under the robust post-crisis regulatory regimes, particularly the stress testing mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act, the largest banks are already required to hold capital for extraordinary levels of economic and industry challenges. We believe that either Cecil or the capital regimes must be modified in order to avoid the adverse effects that Cecil may drive on consumers, small businesses, and on our economy. Thank you, and I look forward to answering questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Blankley. Mr. Zandi, you're recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you Chairman uh, Luke Meyer, uh, Ranking Member Clay, the rest of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I am the Chief economy, uh, Economist of Moody's Analytics. These are my views, not those of Moody's. Uh, I should also uh, point out that uh, I am on the board of directors of MGIC, a national mortgage lender insurer, and um, also the lead director of the Reinvestment Fund, uh, one of the nation's largest uh, community development financial institutions. We invest in underserved communities across the country. Uh, we do a lot of work with the banking industry here in the U.S. and overseas on CECL stress testing and have been very involved in the uh, IFRS 9 process overseas, which is the analog overseas to uh, CECL implementation here, and, and that's already underway overseas. Uh, I'd like to make three points in my remarks. Uh, point number one is uh, I think CECL ado adoption will lead to a stronger, uh, safer uh, financial system and economy. There, there are a number of benefits to CECL. Most importantly, uh, it will be less pro-cyclical than the current incurred loss accounting system. Under incurred loss uh, system, this, the uh, loan loss provisioning is highly pro-cyclical. Uh, we could see that clearly evident in the last recession, the Great Recession. Uh, if you go back to the uh, end of the housing bubble in late 2006, uh, when unemployment was low and house prices were rising very rapidly, Loan loss provisions were also very low, uh, equal to about 1% of uh, outstanding assets. By the end of 2009, coming out of the Great Recession, the loan loss uh, allowance was about uh, a little over 3% of uh, outstanding assets. So a very substantive increase in uh, loan loss provisioning during the period, which exacerbated the decline in, corporate er in bank earnings, uh, profitability, obviously capital, and contributed to the severity of the economic downturn and uh, contributed to the, the credit crunch that uh, soon followed. Uh, take Cecil, uh, if it were in place uh, 10 years ago prior to the Great Recession, uh, during the boom times, during the housing bubble, when lending standards, unemployment was very low, house prices were very high, lending, lending standards were very poor and egregious, Cecil would have required the banking system to reserve at a much higher level than they actually did, which would have hurt earnings, profitability, capital, and incented the banking system to be less aggressive in extending credit during that bubble period. Now, I don't think Cecil would have prevented a bubble. Uh, there was a lot of other dynamics in that period, but it certainly would have mitigated the bubble, bubble and made the subsequent economic crash much, uh, much less serious. Not that Cecil is, uh, is counter-cyclical, it is not, but it is meaningfully less pro-cyclical than the current incurred loss accounting system. And you can read my written testimony to give a very transparent uh, example of how this works for Freddie Mac's mortgage book uh, you know, based on, uh, on, their, on their loan portfolio. Point number two, uh, having said all of that, uh, I think there are things we can do to make this better. Uh, there are some reasonable concerns about Cecil and its adoption. I'll mention two very quickly. First, I think there should be capital relief. Uh, you know, the purpose of Cecil is not to cause the banking system to be higher, more highly capitalized. So, uh, I, you know, it's, it's an open question whether it will result in more capital, but if it does, then, the, then uh, prudential regulators should work to uh, address that, particularly for long duration assets like a mortgage loan uh, or uh, for loans to uh, borrowers of lower credit quality. We don't want the banking system to have to hold more capital against those those types of loans uh, in, a, in, a, in a trouble period. So capital reef is, is essential. And two, I do think there uh, is a good proposal on the table to allow banks to take the first year of the life of the loan loss as a charge in loan losses and put the rest of the, uh, of the loan losses, expected loan losses over the life of the loan in other, uh, other um, 
uh, OCI, other uh, uh, income, and I think that would go a long way to addressing some of the concerns that the banking system has. We can talk about some others, I have some other ideas, but I think those two proposals are pretty good ones and uh, would go a long way to addressing some of the concerns. Uh, finally, third point, uh, I will point out that, uh, you know, we're not leading the way on this accounting change, the rest of the world is. Uh, Europe, Canada, uh, the Middle East, many parts of Asia have already implemented this, and it's really been very graceful, not much to do about nothing. Uh, there are differences, obviously, between IFRS 9 overseas and CECL here, but they're pretty minor uh, and don't change the message uh, that at the end of the day, uh, despite all the hand-wringing overseas about how this would hurt the system and lead to significant problems, it has not. It has been a very graceful implementation, and I think the same will happen here in the United States when CECL is adopted uh, under current uh, regulations in 2020. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, one other housekeeping here. Uh, we want to enter to the record, I believe, uh, some information here. Without objection, I move to include the record on April, uh, an April 16, 2015 letter from the FASB Investor Advisory Committee to FASB's Technical Director and the FASB Rules of Procedure dated through December 11, 2013. Um, objection. Also move to include into the record statements from the American Bankers Association, the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, and the National Credit Union Association. Without objection. Um, with that, I will recognize myself for five minutes and we'll begin the questioning. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Steven, uh, you, you, your business is to invest in banks. Uh, this, in my discussion at the roundtable with FASB, uh, the gentleman there uh, indicated that the reason for this proposal was because he wanted more transparency in the bank's balance sheet to make it easier for investors to be able to see problems or be able to better analyze the, the sheets to be able to do a better job of making sure they wanted to invest in these uh, different banks or not. Um, so I have two, two questions for you. Number one, will this work? Will this be helpful to you? And number two, uh, when you're talking about banks, you know, we've got over roughly over 5,200 banks and there's probably 5,000 of them are probably privately owned. Uh, that doesn't apply. I mean, to me, it wouldn't apply to those banks. Why would this information have to be, why would this accounting system be necessary for them who are privately held? Can you answer those two questions, please? Okay. On your first question, will it work? M my point is, truth of the matter, with the health of our United States banking industry, we could even take a bad model to getting thrown at us. We can. And if I look at Congress right now, you're sitting next to Mr. Clay, and Democrat and Republican, accounting should not be political. It should be neutral. And if you look at the rules of procedure in the FASB, it says that. So my point is, you guys in Congress did something very good five, six, seven, eight years ago. If you look at Dodd-Frank, if you look at what you did in Dodd-Frank, you did some very good things, stress testing, capital formation, excellent. You did it. You made the tackle, to use a football term. You made the tackle, you made the play. But now we got five years later, somebody's gonna jump on the pile, okay? Will it work? No, it won't, okay? But then you start asking about the 5,200 banks, okay? This is a huge burden. I gave you, I look, I gave you seven references, and these references are not to be nice to me. These are references for people who are experts. And I will tell you, when David Kemper at Commerce Bank Shares has to go out and hire a third party because they can't do Cecil alone, I think that should tell you about the complexity. How are these small community banks going to do it? They okay. can't. I got some follow-up questions. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. And, and, and uh, also along the same line, you were a member of the uh, advisory task force, investor advisory committee. Is that correct? Four years. Four years. Sir, okay. Non compensated. And in going through their their principles of how we, uh, which were made a member of rules of procedure here of Brasby's own rules. I have some concerns about this because uh, according to the other information, the letter, the, the dissenting opinion letter that was sent with that, 
Um, there apparently was uh, very little, if no cost benefit analysis done of this. Is that correct? Which is supposed to be in their rules here. I've got it underlined that this is part of their rules process. Was that done? I have never seen a cost benefit analysis. I would hope that you people in Congress have, but I've never seen it. So basically. And we've asked for it too. So they didn't fulfill their, that's one point, they didn't fulfill with regards to their actual duty to, according to their own rules. Um, some of the other things here, uh, it's very questionable in my mind that they've actually fulfilled these as well. But I, so I guess my question is to you, uh, because the rule was never done according to their own rules, if I were sitting here and they were trying to run them, these down my throat, would I have a legal recourse against these folks for, for rules that were improperly done? You know, I, I am not an attorney. Okay. Okay. All I could tell you is I was at the IAC and you saw the comment letter we wrote. I, you've heard me read this, the, this paragraph. A lot of people have said to me, Joe, that is a pretty harsh statement when you're part, when okay, you're- we got One more quick question. Anybody on the committee can answer this question. Okay, if, if a bank, credit union or whatever, makes the loan on a home mortgage, they reserve the money, and then they sell that to the secondary market, um, what happens? Number one, to the reserves that they booked, do you unbook those? Does it go with the, with the loan? Now, and then does the secondary market, if it goes to Fannie and Freddie, do they have to book a reserve on the loan? Because according to Mr. Schroeder, who was at the FASB meeting, he said Fannie and Freddie also have to book these losses. Anybody want to comment? I'll comment on that. Um, as the loan is sold, it would come off your balance sheet and you would release the related reserve, the allowance associated with okay. that loan. All that would come off and you would sell, you know, record that, uh, that sale at the fair value that you sold it at. The buyer would put that loan on their books and record their own estimate of allowance. And one of the things that I think is interesting here is that the buyer and the seller could have completely different allowances when that loan comes on their books based on different views of the forward economy but you do have it correct in terms of the way that would function. Okay, so with Fannie and Freddie, they're already broke. They're gonna to have to figure out how to reserve for, the, for, the, for those, those, those loans. Is that correct? That's correct. Holy smokes, okay. So under the, uh, under the rules, this is a three-year phase-in, and if you do the arithmetic, uh, you know, they'll, they'll have to reserve more, but it will not require them to go back. So basically, in order to reserve for a Freddie and Fannie loan, those folks are going to, whoever has that loan with, with uh, that is sitting in their portfolio, they're going to have a, har a more charge. They're going to be cost, they're going to cost more for those loans because somebody's going to have to reserve for them, so then it's going to get passed on to the consumer, is it well, not? Well, if the asset's on your balance sheet, you have to reserve for it, right? It's just a question so of how much Freddie and Fannie have to reserve for it. If, if HUD has to do this, they're going to charge more, right? No, not necessarily. I mean, if you do the arithmetic on this, they should not have to charge more. No. They don't have to reserve for loans, home loans? No, they have to reserve for loans, but if you do, the, the diff, the, this is the difference. The difference is upfront reserving, less the present value of the stream of future reserving, less the interest or uh, return on the increased loan loss reserves you're holding. Into the day, somebody's going to have to reserve more for that loan. That's the only way this is going to work. That's it, doesn't raise, it should not raise the cost in the system. It should not raise the cost for that loan. It should not. My time is up. Uh, with that, we go to the gentleman from uh, Missouri. Mr. Uh, Clay is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me also take this time to thank you um, for your leadership of this subcommittee. It's been, certainly been a pleasure for this term, so thanks. Thank you. Let me um, put it, pose a, um, a question to the entire panel, and it's, uh, comes from a statement from Randall Quarles, Federal Reserve Vice Chair for Supervision, who testified before this committee a few weeks ago in response to a question about Cecil. He seemed to suggest that the regulators are providing banks with ample time to transition to the new accounting standards so that they can closely monitor it and that its impact on stress testing will be neutral. Vice Chairman Qual said, and I quote, I'm always in favor of measures that make more transparent the position of any financial institution, but I do agree with you that the implications of CECL are not currently deeply understood, and we need to have time to understand them. So we have proposed 
a phased in implementation of CISO and how that affects and how that works with our regulatory capital regime. And we think that that will give us time to see how it's working in operation before it gets plugged into the regulatory capital regime. Allow us to see whether there are any changes. I don't know that there are. For firms that are affected by the stress test, CISO could actually be a wash because to the extent that it means a larger reserve at the outset of the period of stress, then you'll chew through that reserve before you chew through other things in the stress test, and it can be a one-to-one -one offset, end of quote. I'll start with Dr. Zandi. Do you agree with Mr. Qualls' assessment, including that Cecil may end up being a wash in terms of the impact on bank stress test results? I, I do. Uh, I, he is bringing up a good point uh, that Cecil will conflate with the stress testing process, and the question is how will the Federal Reserve implement the stress testing process under Cecil? And that's not been determined yet. In fact, that's why the Fed has allowed banks to, to not have to do this for another year so as they figure this out. But, you know, under reasonable assumptions uh, about how the Fed is going to do this, I would be surprised if uh, at the end of the day this is going to result in any significant change in the stress testing process, the results, and ultimately what matters most, the amount of capital that the system has to hold. Okay. How about, Mr. Blackley, you have an opinion on it? Um, the first comment that I would make is that I believe that CECL actually creates a double count in the amount of capital you have to hold. Okay. Today I have capital that's based on an incurred loss model. In the future, if I have to increase my reserves under CECL and I don't get to reduce my capital, haven't I you know, increased the total amount of capital that the bank has? That's going to be a cost that's eventually going to get passed on to the consumer through higher interest rates. And has that issue been raised with we have the raised, We have raised this issue. Right. I believe that it, it is one of the issues that the industry has uh, brought forward to the Fed and to others. Okay. The second thing I would say that in stress testing, the, the way the stress test works, you're trying to look at you know, a, a situation where you have an economic shock that happens very quickly. Most of the worsening in the economy in that hypothetical stress happens almost immediately in the test. I have an accounting rule that says, as soon as something goes, you know, I have a loan that's going bad, I need to recognize you know, the lifetime losses from a, a turn in the economy. I don't understand how you're not going to pull forward all the losses to the beginning of the stress mm -hmm. test and, and cause the bank to ultimately have to hold more capital. Um, so I'm interested to hear how the Fed may solve that problem as thank well. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, any comment on the stress test and yep. whether it's well, a thank you, sir. Uh, I would point out that the Fed's proposal, while it does involve a delay uh, in, a in a gradual implementation, it doesn't suggest that over that course of time there's going to be any adjustment to the standard. Hmm. Uh, as a consequence, the problems that we've discussed, including the pro severe pro-cyclicality and, and negative implications for lending to less than pristine households and small businesses will all still be there when it comes into, when it comes into four. I, uh, with regard to the stress tests, as Mr. Blackley just uh, noted, the stress tests involve projecting how banks would perform under a very severe economic recession. And of course, given the design of CECL, which depends, loan loss reserves depend upon economic projections, that's going to have a big impact. We estimate that the impact would in fact be an additional $500 billion in reserves going from the baseline to the worsening, and that's going to have an effect. Mr. Chairman, can I just get Absolutely. Mr. Stephen to weigh in? Absolutely. Mr. Stephen. Turn on your mic. I don't want to intentionally disagree with one of my panelists, but I have to. But my experiences are totally different. I was a bank examiner. I was there. Okay? When stuff hits the fan, banks have to talk to their examiners. They got to talk to their auditors. And when, when stuff hits the fan, things go bad, there is a race to think the worst. Hmm. And I'm going to give Mr. Clay an example because you still look like you're in great shape. We had a great pitcher in St. Louis, Bob Gibson. We know what he can do at 60 feet. We yeah. know what he can do. But now you want to go out lifetime? Well, let's put Mr. Gibson in center field. How good will his baseball skills be then? This is a different model. 
What an analogy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we just got Goldschmidt over the weekend. We're going to be great next year. Okay, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Clay, now we talk baseball all the time here. Um, Mr. Clay's time has expired. With that, we go to uh, Mr. Rothfuss, a gentleman from Pennsylvania, the vice chairman of the committee. is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nelson, some stakeholders have raised concerns that CECL's requirements will adversely impact the availability and price of credit and have a large impact on longer-term products like mortgages, small business loans, and student loans. Do you share this concern? Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, do you believe that these impacts may be more pronounced for smaller institutions uh, that are more heavily engaged in mortgage lending? Yes, sir. Mr. Stephen, uh, um, it appears that the changes required by CECL would require firms to conduct significantly more modeling and analysis than they do today. How costly would it be for banks to adjust to and operate under CECL? Can we quantify some of those costs? Again, the estimates that are out there, no one knows. I've got quotes from Jamie Diamond at J.P. Morgan just talking about it. And the complexities of this model, no one even has the answers to yet. You've You're talked about, about implementing this next year, even for community banks. Nobody has these estimates done. Yeah, you, you testified about Commerce Bank having to engage third parties to do this type of work. And you're looking at a local community bank. You, this just hasn't been quantified, what the cost is going to be for that. It's, it's, if I had to give a guess, and this is just a guess, it's in the billions. I don't know the number. Nobody does. And that's one of the things. There is supposed to be some type of a cost-benefit analysis I have never seen, and we've asked for it. Um, let's talk about the consumers. I think Mr. Blackley talked about uh, he believes the costs of this are going to be passed along in the form of higher interest rates. Do you see that happening too, Mr. Stephen? Absolutely when, as we all know, things roll downhill. If costs increased in some way, shape, or form, they get passed along to the United States consumer. So it's absolute. Um, what about, Mr. Blackley, I, I mean, how is that going to impact how these community institutions are operating? I mean, what do you see coming down the pike uh, um, in terms of product offerings and, and, and what they're going to be able to do to, to meet the demands of, of the consumers that are out there? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that CECL is, is certainly going to put us in a situation where we want to be able to lend in all um, different economies in good times and bad. We want to make sure that we can serve all markets, and our concern is that CECL because of its front-loaded nature and its breaking of the economic earnings cycle is gonna put us in a situation in the middle of, of, a, of a downturn where we're not going to be able to lend to, you know, to underserved communities and to um, you know, folks that are, are non-prime credit. It is just going to be harder when you're trying to husband your capital to then go forward and lend when you have to take that loss day one before you've recognized any revenue. Yeah, this is, sounds a little bit like deja vu, as I recall a report that Steve Strongman did from Goldman Sachs talking about the two-speed economy that we saw going uh, over the last 10 years, where he, he looked at the financial regulation generally that was coming out of this town having a, a, an impact greater on those smaller financial institutions. Uh, the big folks were able to find those third parties that could help out. They could retain the lawyers. They could retain... Uh, the consultants, the accountants, to navigate the, the complexity that was coming down the pike. But not so for the, the smaller institutions, and we saw the concentration and loss of our community financial institutions, one a day even. Um, is this, are we looking, we made some great progress with uh, S2155, providing meaningful relief to our community financial institutions. Do you see this kind of taking one step back again? I would ask uh, Mr. Stevens that. I think S2155 was absolutely a step in the correct direction. Okay, if you look at Dodd-Frank, even Barney Frank of Dodd-Frank has said, it's gone too far, we've got to be reasonable. Paul Volcker has even, of the Volcker rule has said, wait a second, we've gone too far. We have to be reasonable. So I want to again compliment Congressman Clay, Congressman Luke Demeyer. 
If you look at the changes in the banking industry over the last 10 years, the most important, the fundamental of a bank, the foundation is tangible common equity. That's the foundation of all capital. If you look at the numbers in this industry, I could throw numbers out that would probably amaze 99% of the people in this room. Citicorp's tangible common equity in 2008 was 1.56%. 1.56. Does anybody have a clue what it is today? 8.05. It's 5x what it was 10 years ago. Bank of America, which had to acquire it. My point is, you did a great job. This other thing is too complex. It's going to hurt your community banks. Yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, we go with the gentleman from New York. Mr. Meeks is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stevens, uh, my neighbor here said that uh, Mr. Gibson, uh, he knows someone that could hit him from 60 miles, uh, from 60 feet away. He said he is, his, his brother-in-law could handle him a little bit well. His brother-in-law happens to be Hank Aaron. <laughs> Another Hall of Famer. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me ask, I'm listening, and uh, it's real interesting to me, and I'll start, and I'll probably ask everyone in the panel, but I'll start with Mr. Zandi. I, I, I understand the potential investor, because I understand that this accounting scheme is about, it was for the investor, uh, so that they would understand the value uh, of a financial institution. So I kind of get it from an investor side. However, considering the reforms that Mr. Stevens was talking about, whether it's capital uh, standards or stress testing, et cetera, that we may do in Dodd-Frank, I'm trying to understand why is Cecil necessary from a safety and soundness perspective, uh, which is what I'm talking about. Why is Cecil necessary? Well, uh, remember back to the period prior to the financial crisis, Great Recession, and during the financial crisis and Great Recession. Prior, we had a bubble, uh, very egregious mortgage lending, uh, very poor lending in the commercial real estate spe sector, s commercial industrial lending. Uh, there was lots of credit going everywhere at very, under, very low underwriting standards. That was the bubble that set the stage for the financial crisis that caused the financial system to effectively collapse without support from the federal government. Cecil, and the, one of the reasons for that, uh, that dynamic, and it, there's many reasons, you know, capital was clearly one of them, but one of the reasons for that was the loan loss accounting system that we have in place, incurred loss. Under incurred loss, you, the current system, you only book the loss when you take it, but in these boom times when things are great, there's no losses. I mean, you can go to San Diego in 2006, there wasn't a single default on the mortgage because things were rip-roaring, but it was all fake. It was all false. It was all a bubble. But under Cecil, because you were extending this credit to bad credits, people with, you know, they were lying about income, lying about their, uh, you would have to reserve a lot more, and if you reserved a lot more, you would make less loans. So the That's bubble just would have been less that, that That's safety off. and soundness. I'm just trying to say, but that was the problem in my estimation. The problem was we had no dock loans and some of the exotic mortgages but why? that was, was there so that they could package them. They, I mean, I think many of the folks knew that was, there was the fraud there and that they would package them and they would sell them, but they knew in the beginning because they didn't ever check the documentation that they may be bad Congressman, loans. Congressman, if, if, so, if I were a lender and I made that loan no dock and I knew that that had a higher probability of default because it's no dock, I'd have to book a higher loan loss reserve under Cecil and if I have to do that, I'm less likely to make that loan. But That's what I don't, what, 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 what my question is, and, and I just want to ask because I'm concerned, is I kind of agree, I think, with Mr. Stevens that what we tried to do in Dodd-Frank was to fix that yeah. so that they wouldn't do that again, so that wouldn't happen. That was the sole purpose of Dodd-Frank, to make sure that we got it right so this couldn't happen again. And from what I understand with reference to CISU, it was, or it is, primarily for an investor to do some value, but no. I'm, I'm, I'm con here's what I, my concern is. My concern is it have a reversed effect, and I think a couple of members have said it. I don't want people going out not having access, because that's what happens, I don't want to go out not having access to capital and to loans, or feeling that they have to go to um, 
um, payday lenders or anything else where they gotta pay some more money. I, and, and especially, I, I know that uh, the former, chair, uh, former Fed Chair Ben Bernanke identified the concept he called financial accelerator. Uh, and it's with the idea that recessions tend to disrupt the flow of credit which makes the uh, worst down the, the downturns worse, and so people then don't have access to it, and so folks in the community like mine have no alternative. They have no access to credit at all, so they go totally to these right. payday lenders that, that, and they pay all this money. Totally right. But what you want is you, you want the, the lenders to provide credit through the business cycle in good times and bad, and if they don't lend as to poor credits, very bad credits, no doc, no down payment. In the bad times, it's much more likely that in the, in, in the good times, they're much more likely to have the resources and the ability to lend more in the bad times. That's the principle behind. But I'm also asking particularly small size banks to have to pay more money for these regulations while they're closing up in my district now. And then my folks don't have access to banks. And that means that I am actually, you know, <laughs> causing another problem or a bigger problem for the folks that I represent. And they don't want, I don't want them to go, have to go to payday lenders. Sure. And if I'm closing the opportunities for them to go to banks, because I'm making it, especially the small banks, I'm making it more difficult for them and more costly for them, because it's still a bank. You know, I'm, I'm a capitalist, I'm saying, so I know they're not doing it to give away money. They want to make some money. Um, but I want it to be reasonable, whereas the payday lenders are not reasonable. I, I, I understand them over time. I love you. I, love, I yield back. I, lo I love your venting, though, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we go to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nelson, I find the dissenting FASB votes to raise some very troubling prospects regarding Cecil. For example, those members noted under the new method, a growing portfolio of loans will have a negative effect on profitability, and that seems to kind of reinforce the old country adage. The people who can borrow money don't need money. And when you reduce the profitability, you take away the incentive to engage in the market. Now, because of the requirement to record, of course, full lifetime expected losses, they also believe that Cecil method will have unintended implications for the willingness of lenders to lend under certain circumstances and certain kind of borrowers. I will acknowledge to you in my district, I represent a goodly number of both agricultural producers uh, and energy producers. And for the sake of discussion right now, I'd like to focus on the ag side of the equation. Given those statements above, I'm concerned that farmers in a rough farm economy, and we're into that right now, might have their credit dry up under Cecil. Can you elaborate when on, and what uh, some of the unintended consequences might be in this regard? Yeah, I think you have very good reason to be concerned. I mean, what we've found is that because of the in the, the disparate way that Cecil reflect, uh, accounts for expected losses versus expected income, uh, it gives banks a strong disincentive to lend to, in, to make loans that have higher expected loss rates or loans with longer terms, uh, and that would include agriculture loans. They would have to book a significant loss right up front when making those loans, and that amount would go up when, they, uh, you know, when times appeared to be worse. Mr. Nelson, sticking with you, FASB recently signaled support for an amendment to Cecil that would require financial institutions to break charge-offs and recoveries out by vintage year. I would imagine that any entity who buys debt, be it a bank or otherwise, would probably need to radically change their current reporting practices if this amendment passes. Can you discuss how such an amendment would impact those entities? I'm sorry, sir. Could you repeat what the, end of the, the, the amendment was again? The, the FASB recently signaled support for an amendment to Cecil that would require financial institutions to break charge-offs and recoveries out by vintage year. I would imagine that any entity who buys debt, be it a bank or otherwise, would probably need to radically change their current reporting practices if the, this amendment passes. Could you touch on that? Yeah, certainly. So currently, charge-offs... Uh, Could you please pull the microphone toward oh, you a little bit, Mr. Nelson? Sorry, sir. You know, currently, uh, charge-offs and recoveries are recorded on the, the loan level basis. So, uh, having to be being have required to record those uh, amounts at the loan vintage basis would, would require significantly more work on the part of the uh, the banks. 
One last question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Blackley, should there be a cost-benefit analysis done before agreeing to such an amendment? Uh, I think that uh, starting with a cost-benefit analysis is probably the first thing we need to do. I believe that we also need to then either change CECL, modify how it works. Um, Capital One and 20 other banks have provided a proposal to the FASB that we believe would um, eliminate a number of the problems that we've discussed today, including the procyclicality and the upfront cost of lending. If we're not able to change the accounting standard, then we're going to need to do something to modify the capital frameworks to allow for us to not have to hold more upfront capital. I believe that you know a lot of the, the work that, that Congress has already done after the financial crisis with you know, Dodd-Frank and stress testing regime and other capital standards have broadly already dealt with all of the problems that Cecil was initially intended to, to deal with. So at this point, you know, my, my view would be that the best course of action would be to just eliminate Cecil. Well stated, Mr. Blackley. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. That would go to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Is recognized Thank, you. Five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman, and let me Congratulate you on winning your re-election. Good to have you back with us, my bipartisan partner. Good to have you. Good to be with you, and uh, I, I saw many of the battles between Mr. Aaron and Mr. Gibson. They were good ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Cardinals and the Braves. Can't go better than that. Okay, what I'd like to kind of zero in on is this um, – CISO and how it addresses comparability between different financial institutions. I think that's the core of the argument here we have today. And, and the reason I bring that up is because we worked hard on Dodd-Frank. I was a part of that. And we worked hard to reduce the complexity and increase the comparability between banks. We have an extraordinary banking system but it is extremely diverse. There's so many different institutions. Now, as I understand it, the CECL accounting method does not specify a single method of, for measuring credit loss, but allows any reasonable approach that meets GAAP accounting standards. Is that correct, Mrs. Zanny? You're yeah, shaking that, your correct, head. That's correct, yes. All right, I want to make sure I'm right. Now, let me go to you, Mr. Bailey, Blakely. In your test, written testimony, you stated, and I quote, as institutions may make different judgments about the future performances of their portfolios, readers of financial statements will be forced to reconcile the differences to fully understand the comparability of financial results is what you said, correct? Now, uh, I want you to elaborate on the impact that this has on the ability to compare the health of banks, the great diversity of them, small, large, regional, you name it, across the industry, and whether these different models could impact the cost that consumers might see for different credit reports like mortgages and small business loans. That's the core of it. That particularly in areas that are already experiencing less bank competition. Could you address that? Certainly, thank you. Um, the, the points on comparability, I believe, are having, you know, as the CFO for the company, I spend a lot of time with our investor base. And one of the core concerns that they have brought forward to me is we don't know how we're going to compare two different banks. There was recently an article in the Wall Street Journal that talked about, um, as Mr. Zandi spoke about, in, in the international um, banking community, there's already been an accounting standard that I would call CISO light that has gone into effect. And, you know, the Wall Street Journal was commenting on how banks in the UK had already started recording allowances that varied one bank to another, and no one could really explain why those differences were occurring. So I do think there is a risk when you've got to rely on an economic forecast. I have two great economists sitting here. They both have different views of where the economy is going to go. Just imagine they're different banks. They're going to have different allowances. 
So I do believe that it's going to create differences in opinion about, you know, and comparability issues between banks. Yeah. Can Let I point me, out, Congressman? Okay. Yes. This is this yeah. I view as a feature, not a bug. This goes to allowing smaller banks and institutions the flexibility they need to address the Cecil standard without requiring all the big changes that a larger institution like Capital One would would want to implement. And and, and, and more, let me just say this right 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 quick. I am also the chairman of the subcommittee that deals with swaps, derivatives, the whole cross border situation. And 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 I and, 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 uh, Mr. Zaney, you began to allude into it in terms of the European models and all of that. What what what? Where do we stand now in terms of our own financial system? In terms of what we got here, and then when you expand all these companies that have direct and indirect impacts overseas. So right now we got the two dynamics with the largest sections of the European economy in Great Britain with their problem with Brexit and the exit from the European Union, and France, which uh, I'm really worried about that situation. Could you tell us, in your estimation, what impact what is happening now on the European continent uh, will have on our financial banking system? Well, let me say, I think our banking system is uh, rock solid. I think because of Dodd-Frank, because of many of the other changes that have been made since the Great Recession, including, I, I would hope, the adoption of Cecil at some point, means that the uh, U.S. banking system is, can, can weather any storm. I mean, we've heard the capitalization levels are measurably higher, liquidity levels are measurably better, the risk management in place measurably uh, better. Uh, we are in a much better place today. So I think we can weather many storms, Brexit storm, what's going on in France, uh, but it doesn't mean we should stop, and I do think Cecil would put our system on even sounder ground if we went down the path. Sure, there are changes we should make to make it work better and address the reasonable concerns that you're hearing expressed today, but at the end of the day, if we want comparability with the rest of the world, we should adopt something similar to Cecil. All right. Mr. Stevens, yeah. I was at the FASB on the ITAC when we discussed IFRS 9, and IFRS 9 and Cecil are not the same. And in fact, many people, I don't want to say, but in many of my discussions with people inside FASB and outside of FASB, the IFRS 9 model is only sort of close to our current model. They're, the United States banking system has the toughest standards. You look at our, I mean, I think any of the panelists would say, you look at the capital standards our U.S. banks have compared to other international banks, we are much stronger. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, we go to the uh, gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the panel taking time to be able to be here today. One, one of my primary concerns happens to be our local community banks. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, economics simply don't work if you can't get a loan. Uh, you've got to be able to get out into the community, be able to borrow the money. And we've had real concern expressed uh, from our community banks in Colorado, the areas that I represent, uh, about some of the new requirements that are coming in. Ms. Stevens, would you maybe speak, is this going to actually, uh, I think Mr. Zandi had mentioned, it's going to give community banks more flexibility under these new regulations. Would you concur with that? Do you have a different opinion? Absolutely not. I don't believe so. This model is so complex as in my perfect example was Commerce, which is a regional bank. Mm -hmm. They can't figure out, they're the safest, one of the safest banks in the country. Explain to me how just a good community bank is going to figure it out. That's your answer. It's, it's not even me giving you my opinion. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. now, Mr. S uh, Nelson, maybe you'd like to weigh in on this as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to. As I mentioned, our research has, has uh, concluded that CISO is going to be particularly difficult for banks that, that focus on small business lending, mortgage lending, lending to households with perhaps not perfect credit, student lending, uh, precisely the kind of business models that smaller banks specialize in. 
Uh, there's current industry estimates, not our estimates right now, that, that say that if you're a bank that, est that focuses on corporate lending, you know, right now you wouldn't see your capital reduced very much by, by the implementation of CISO, perhaps uh, half a percentage point. But if you're a, a retail bank, a bank that focuses on, on, on retail customers and small businesses, your capital could be reduced by as much as two percentage points. Thank you. Uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, one, one of the issues we've really had in Colorado, we've had a tale of two economies, uh, where a lot of our urban areas have done very well, a lot of our rural economies have continued to struggle. And uh, Mr. Blackley, uh, would you see perhaps some of this over-regulation potentially on some of the small com community banks? Could this create a downward trend in economic activity, or is this something that's going to stimulate economic activity? Um, could you uh, restate the question? I'm sorry, I missed the front end of that. You bet. Uh, it's, it's a tale of two economies, uh, where rural areas versus urban areas. We've got small community banks into the rural areas. If we're going to increase the compliance burdens on a bank that has a hundred million dollars in assets sitting, uh, is, is this going to stimulate economic activity or is it going to deter it? I, I really have a tough time seeing how it would be possible to stimulate economic activity. We're a very, um, you know, large complex bank. We have sophisticated tools which are allowing us to prepare for CECL. It's going to take us a year running in parallel to ensure that our systems are prepared when this thing goes effective in 2020, I think that it would be, you know, considerably harder for a small institution that doesn't have the same scale and sophistication to be able to do that. I also think that, you know, Cecil has the propensity, as, as Mr. Nelson was saying, to really punish consumer and small business lending because those loans typically have, you know, people that are new to credit have higher losses. The upfront burden of lending to those types of um, borrowers is going to make it less likely you're going to be able to do that. And that's right in the bailiwick of many consumer banks and, or, or small banks. And so I do think that it would be, uh, it would be a headwind for, for the folks that you're talking about. And just overall, uh, and uh, if you'd like to, be, to speak to, just in terms of reducing some of the regulatory requirements, we'd had uh, S2155 that my colleague had mentioned. Uh, we've tried to be able to make sure that we've not have regulations, but smart regulations to be able to have good outcomes. Uh, is this going to run counter to actually having smart regulations to be able to help the economy move? I think many of the decisions around tailoring that have been made, um, S2155, or some of the comments that we've seen um, from the Federal Reserve on tailoring are absolutely going in the right direction to try to tailor regulation to the size and the risk of an institution. CECL, I think, applies to everyone equally. It's hard for us all. And so I do believe it is a bit of a step backward in terms of simplifying and making sure that the, the regulations that we all have to follow are appropriate for the size and the risk of the institution. Mr. Nelson, do you care to comment on that? I agree. I don't have much to add. No. Okay. Ms. Stevens? I have nothing to add, but I agree. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, we've got an opportunity to re be able to address something that's going to be regulatory overreach, and I hope that this hearing is going to be able to highlight uh, the real impact that this is going to have on the financial institutions, but ultimately on the moms and dads that are trying to be able to provide for their families at home and to be able to build those small businesses. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. With that, we go to the gentleman from Washington. Mr. Heck is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, always a good day when you have the opportunity to ask one's favorite economist in the country a couple of questions, Mr. Zandi. And I want That's to take a slightly different say. tack here. By the way, my forecasts are always right, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've obviously seen a significant shift in some lending markets. Some might even say dramatic shift in some lending markets from uh, banks to non-banks over the last decade. I'm frankly not entirely sure what's causing that, but I hope it's not bad policy. This rule obviously applies to all lenders, and so I'm wondering if you could talk about how you think it might be implemented, if so, differently with respect to regulated banks and credit uh, unions versus uh, non-banks, and whether or not you think this brings us closer to a level playing field or the opposite, or does it not have any effect in your opinion? I think it, uh, it, because it does apply across the board to all financial institutions, whether they're in the regulated part of the system, the banking system, or in the non-regulated part of the system, uh, I don't think it should change the 
playing field to any significant degree. Um, I do, I am sympathetic to your point, though, that um, we have seen risk move from the regulated part of the system, the banking system, to the unregulated part of the system, the shadow system, in part because some of the regulations, some of the capitalization requirements, liquidity requirements on the banking system uh, have changed the economics and pushed risk out. And that's one of the limits to requiring the banks to be even more highly capitalized. And we have to be very careful and sensitive not to uh, overdo that because the risk will just go somewhere where it's less transparent and do more damage. In fact, you can kind of, it's a quick tangent, you can kind of see this happening in the leveraged loan market. You know, this is lending to a highly levered non-financial corporations, and a lot of that's being done by non-banks, and this is where the real financial vulnerabilities are in the current system. But in terms of CECL and the adoption of CECL, I don't see that, I, I don't, it doesn't, it, I, haven't, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that it's gonna change the, the, the dynamics between the regulated part of the system and the unregulated part of the I system. I guess I'm prompted, and I don't mean to cast aspersions or impugn <laughs> motives in any way, but uh, on the one hand, you'll have the banks and regulators, uh, the banks and the credit unions um, overseen by federal regulators uh, with respect to how it is that they construct their models and their assumptions, and on the non-banks, you don't. And where are the incentives there? But I have another question I want to get to. Since GSEs have been referred to a couple of three times here, I can't help but ask <laughs> Uh, it's been mentioned in press reports that the president is considering nominating somebody to head the FH, FHFA uh, who is an open advocate for winding down, if not eliminating the GSEs, and as opposed to the 30-year fixed mortgage. I'm wondering if you'd care to comment about uh, what you think the impl implication to the economy would be if that were to be realized, and if you've got time and you don't have a lot, compare it to the effect on the economy, for example, of, of CECL and any contraction and lending that may occur there. Yeah, good point. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a, uh, uh, a momentum towards scaling back uh, the GSE's footprint, Fannie and Freddie, and the uh, potential changes at the FHFA seem to signal that we're moving in that direction. My hope is, my sense is that, you know, once person is uh, running the show is there that uh, they'll have second thoughts about eliminating the 30-year fixed rate loan or significantly scaling back loan limits or raising G fees, things that would do a lot of damage to the housing market, which is already struggling, as you know, in the current rising rate environment. So I, I think better angels will prevail uh, when you're actually having to sit down and make a decision. But clearly, it's something we need to watch very carefully, and it is a matter of... Would you be very concerned if that stated preference were to be pursued? I, I, clearly, that would be a, a huge error, uh, and it would do a lot of damage to the housing mortgage markets, to home ownership, and ultimately to the broader economy. So, pretty bad idea, and that would... Cecil would pale in comparison to what we're talking about here, potentially with the GSEs. Might I just add parenthetically and to conclude that I think we've seen the movie before where we finish the sentence, well, once they are there, better angels might. <laughs> right, good point. <laughs> With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I hear you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now we go to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the panel being here. <clears throat> Incredibly uh, uh, important issue that we're talking about here. And, and as, as I was listening to the, the other to all the panelists and, and my colleagues up here, my mind went back to uh, when I worked intelligence in the Air Force. One of our contractors that worked with us developing IT systems was tasked with developing a hack-proof computer to handle all of the analysis of our intelligence because security was concerned. And they did it. They actually produced a system that could not be hacked. The problem was it was not useful. No one could use it. It was too slow. So we backed off and we said, okay, the importance is managing the risk, which is really what we're talking about here. And I, I, I fear that from a small business standpoint, that what bean counters and ivory towers sometimes miss is what the underlying strength of our economy is. 
is it's an entrepreneurial-based economy. And that's why what works in Europe doesn't necessarily work here in the United States because we're an entrepreneurial-based economy, which really breaks down to those who have money managing the risk to allow those who don't have the money or need the money at the time they need it to borrow that money. It's always about managing the risk, and I think what we try to do is regulate away all the risk, which basically results in the people who have money only being able to loan it to the people who don't need the money at the times they don't need it. We've seen that happen over and over and over again. And, and I've heard us talk about, well, that, that Cecil itself won't raise the cost of lending, um, or... It, it, it in itself won't reduce the number of loans, but the real result is when it comes down to it, in the bad times, which I, I don't see how you can say this isn't cyclical, it's, it is definitely pro-cyclical because during the, the lean times when small businesses like mine needed to borrow the money the most and could not borrow it, the banks are going to look at, well, if if the projection is this business is, is going to be a little bit more risk, I'm just not going to make that loan because I don't want to hold on to that additional capital that I could be using to make more loans. And then when you, when you talk about the complexity of it, the biggest complaint I'm getting from our small banks and credit unions right now is the number of compliance specialists they already have to have. And if you're going to increase the number of compliance specialists, it's going to be additional cost to the consumer, to the small business, which the end result is less money to loan. And I think there's some empirical analysis that, that would, would back this up. Mr. Nelson, if I'm not mistaken, uh, your organization, the Bank Policy Institute, uh, did do an analysis of the previous uh, economic crisis. And if, if I'm not mistaken, did not your analysis show that had Cecil been in effect uh, in 2009, it would have actually, the 10% uh, the reduction in loans would actually have been increased to 19%. Is that true? Would you like to elaborate? So that's correct. So we estimated that uh, had Cecil been in effect, uh, banks' uh, CET common equity capital ratios would have been more than one and one half percentage points lower at the worst point in the crisis. And using estimates from another paper that was just recently published in the Journal of Finance, that, that additional, that reduction in capital requirements, we estimate would have lowered bank lending by an additional 9%, precisely as you said. Now, I experienced some of this in my own business. Back in uh, 1995 to 2000, I was best friends with my local banker because we're starting a business. We didn't have a lot of capital. We needed capital. They came in and said, look, you're probably not the, the, the person just on your books that we would loan to, but you have contracts and POs in hand that we know we can we can pretty much rely on. And they loaned us money. We kept loans and lines of credit open up until... 2001, 2002, we were doing so well I didn't need the money. I paid off all the loans, all the lines of credit. But then came 2008 and 2009 when our reserves were depleted, but I had the opportunity to do some very large projects, but I just didn't have the capital to buy the equipment. I go back to the same bank and said, I can't do it anymore. The government's telling me I can't. And, and, and what that result was is I had to do a massive layoff in my own business, which I would have probably been another one of those additional uh, 9%. Mr. Blackley, um, have the banking regulators conclusively stated whether there will be a corresponding offset in regulatory capital requirement for the additional capital required by Cecil? At this point, the only um, tangible rulemaking that has come out from the banking regulators is to give us relief in a phase-in period over three years for the initial adoption impact of Cecil. What we have not yet seen is any adjustments that will need to be made for what I conceive of as a double count of the, the, um, the consequences of CECL on capital, and they have it also not clarified how they might need to adjust the stress test um, under Dodd-Frank in order to you know, address the changes that are under CECL. So we're still waiting to see um, how they may address those items. All right, thank you. Ms. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, we go to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. She's recognized for five minutes. Ranking member for calling this uh, this hearing, Doctor Doctor Zandi, I understand Cecil requires banks to immediately recognize expected losses on a loan, but not any expected income on the loan. And what is the reason for this? Is it just to make banks err on the side of uh, caution? And I might add that on stress tests, 
They also require banks to assume losses on the federal stress test, uh, and, uh, on, but not income on those loans. So could you comment on that and your understanding of it? Sure. Uh, you're right. I mean, as currently envisaged, Cecil does not allow the institutions mm -hmm. to recognize interest income. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there has been a proposal to, in fact, allow that to occur, uh, which is not unreasonable, uh, although if they're going to uh, recognize the interest income, they should also recognize the interest expense. Uh, now, this all sounds very easy to say, and for an economist to say it, pretty straightforward, but there are all, all kinds of, this would really complicate the implementation of CECL, and uh, there may be other, many other accounting issues involved that I'm not even aware of uh, that are deep into the uh, accounting standards. So, uh, in theory, it's probably not a bad idea, but in practice, I'm not sure it's going to change the result here to any significant degree, but it will certainly raise the complexity of what's being proposed here. Also, Dr. Zandi, there seems to be a general agreement that the accounting standard for loan losses should not be pro-cyclical and should ideally be counter-cyclical. And, and you acknowledge in your testimony that if Cecil had been in place during the financial crisis and the Great Depression, it still would have been pro-cyclical, but much less pro-cyclical than the old accounting standard. Is there any accounting standard that would have been counter-cyclical during the Great Recession? It's a great point. Uh, and just to, just to reinforce the point, uh, Cecil will not be counter-cyclical. It will simply be less pro-cyclical than the current incurred loss yeah. accounting system, which is highly pro-cyclical, meaning you know, it uh, opens the floodgates during the boom times and it really restricts the availability of credit in the bad times. That's what's trying, what Cecil is trying to correct. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some things that, you know, in theory could be done to try to make Cecil uh, even less pro-cyclical or even counter-cyclical, you know, around setting uh, the economic scenarios and how they're determined in the future. That would be one way of go, going about doing it. Or uh, even around uh, the amount of loan loss provisioning that would occur for uh, different types of lending at different points in the cycle. But the, as you can tell, this is getting to be very, very complex, and I'm not sure we get significant lift. I, in my view, let's just take this step. This is a very good step. It's not as complex as people think. There's a lot of flexibility here so that small banking institutions and credit unions can adopt this very painlessly and this will make the system less pro-cyclical, meaning we're not going to have these bubbles, or to at least to the same degree, and we're not going to have these busts to the same degree. We're going to sell bubbles and busts, but just not to the same degree. Okay, I would like to, uh, Mr. Nelson, uh, if you would follow up and comment on this, is there another accounting standard that would have been counter-cyclical during the Great Recession? And, and if you want to comment on how Cecil could be tweaked so it could have been counter-cyclical in any way, in addition to what Dr. Zandi has said. And uh, I would also, after Mr. Nelson, invite other members of the panel if they'd like to comment on it. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Uh, but first, first, let me comment on uh, Moody's conclusion that Cecil would, in fact, be less uh, pro-cyclical than the current accounting standard. And th that, that result was released in a paper that was released at the end of last week. Unfortunately, there are some analytical flaws and, and mistakes in the paper that make that paper an unreliable guide for the cyclical properties of Cecil. And I'll name just two of them. First of all, the analysis is based on a, only a single type of loan, 30-year mortgages, 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgages, and only on the highest quality types of those loans. Consequently, it's not surprising that those loans don't exhibit a lot of cyclicality in their, in their uh, performance over the business cycle. But secondly, and perhaps more critically, uh, when they do their analysis, uh, and as they as have to estimate what the allowance would be under Cecil and what the allowance would be under incurred loss. When they estimated the loss under Cecil, they assumed that when a mortgage goes bad, banks would be able to recover 65% of that loan. But when they did the analysis for the incurred loss methodology, they assumed that if the loan went bad, they would recover nothing on the loan. 
Correcting for that mistake by itself overturns their finding that the Cecil allowance would be less procyclical than the incurred loss allowance. To answer your question, uh, you know, there are a number, I, I think the very fact that, you know, what we're asking for today is that based on the, the serious concerns that have been raised and the complexity and magnitude of this issue, that there be time to, 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 to wait, to not implement it, and to take time to, to study further and develop alternatives. There have been suggestions raised. Uh, the regional banks uh, led by Capital One have, have put forward a proposal uh, that deserves serious consideration. Um, thank you for your question. Number one, I don't believe there is a way to remove business cycles, period. So I, I think it's the best thing that you can do to help the safety of the banking industry is what you did in Dodd-Frank, which is the foremost foundation of bank capital is tangible common equity. And if you look at the improvements that you, along with your regulations, along with the regulators, have done, you've done an excellent job. And not trying to patch on the back, but you actually did a good job. The concept of using reserves to quote unquote be counters, no, the, your eye has to remain on the ball, which is tangible common equity. It's the base, regulators will tell you, anybody in the business will tell you. That's the key and you did it. Gentlemen, each time has expired. With that, we go to the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to continue that uh, discussion a little bit <clears throat> um, because I, I definitely share concerns that Cecil, if implemented, could, in fact, have some um, pretty maybe unintended consequences in a downturn from a standpoint of um, uh, um, access to lending and, and uh, access to capital. Um, for those um, businesses and firms and households that, that could lead a recovery. Um, but I'd, I wanted to, to, to ask the other uh, panelists to comment on Mr. Zandi's argument that, um, in fact, um, uh, the proposal, Cecil proposal, is uh, less um, pro-cyclical than the incurred loss standard. If you disagree with that, uh, can you elaborate? And I'll, I'll start with Mr. Blackley. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, look, from a, a practitioner's perspective, you know, building allowances, what I, am, I, am, I know for certain is that it is very difficult for a bank to project a future that is different from what we're seeing today. And so, you know, I think that Cecil is going to be pro-cyclical by that very fact, because as we move through the, the cycle, we'll be picking up increasingly big forecasts of losses. Those will be coming into to our allowances as we move. Can I, can I interject a question? Certainly. What Mr. Zandi, what I think I heard him say is that if you, if you reserve more, that that will strengthen the financial condition of the institution during a downturn. What, what about that you disagree with? Well, I, certainly having a strong capital base is, is critical to, the, to all of banks. And what's going to happen is we are, as we're building our reserves, that actually will be reducing our capital levels. At the point of, of an economic downturn where, you know, things are really starting to, to decay, we're going to be very cautious with deploying that capital. And that means that under Cecil, where you have to front load the, you know, the, the penalty for making a loan, that's just going to put pressure on us to make loans to, to small businesses, to you know, any of the types of credits that tend to have uh, a higher loss rate to them. And so I do believe that it's going to be pro-cyclical and bad on the economy. Um, Mr. Zandi, you've, you've heard what Mr. Stephen has said on multiple occasions, I think very persuasively, and that is that, uh, uh, that we've strengthened the capital position of these institutions significantly, both in terms of Basel III and in, in terms of the uh, CCAR stress testing capital regimes that are now in place. Um, my question to you is, given that, what problem are we trying to solve here? We're trying to reduce the cyclicality of the provision of credit and the impact on the business cycle. We're now in a boom time. These are good times, and credit is flowing. Uh, underwriting standards are declining. You can particularly see this in the lending to not large, non-financial corporate businesses. Janet Yellen gave a speech last night talking about this as an as a existential threat 
to the economic expansion. Under incurred loss, provisioning is very low for those loans because there's no defaults. But if the capital, what he's saying though, is if the capital levels are extremely healthy. They, they are, but, but we want a safer, a safer and less cyclical system. So right now under CECL, the banking and non-bank institutions, the private equity firms, hedge funds, everyone who's extending this credit would have to be reserving more today their, their earnings would be lower, their capital would be lower, and they therefore would extend less credit. Therefore, when we get into the recession, this will be less of a risk. I'd, I'd love to hear your response to that. Mr. Stephen. The concept that the incurred, that's a past tense, okay? My third grade English teacher would tell me that's past tense, okay? If I asked you a question, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but if you look at bank industry data for the last 25 years, do you know how far out in advance the average bank has been reserved for the last 25 years? But this is an incurred loss model. That implies you're looking backward. Do you know what the average bank has reserved out? Two years. So the concept that banks aren't looking forward currently, that is a joke. It's a mistake. It's not the truth. Okay, Banks are looking out. Well, when you book a loss on day one, uh, but you do not recognize the potential for loan revenue, does that mirror reality? I started as a bank regulator 35 years ago. I grew up with that. Um, I would say I'm biased to keep it because I want a strong banking system. And we've got it. But now to, as Jamie Dimon once said, We've got gold-plated standards, and now you want to keep going? Where do we stop? Is 100% capital the right number for banks? That means they don't make loans. My point is, we're there. Congressman, to answer your question, on a portfolio of loans, absolutely yes. You 100 loans, two of them we know are going to default, and there's going to be a loss given default, so why don't we recognize that when it happens? Because we know it. My time has expired, but this is a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. That would go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman's recognized Thank you. Minutes. I'm a little concerned about talking about um, being counter-cyclical. From an economic standpoint, I can understand we want our banks to be lending in the bad times. But the fact is that the financial services industry is a very volatile business. You make money in the good times, you lose money in the bad times. And in other industries, at least, people try to smooth earnings, make investors think that things are all smooth when in fact life is jagged, and uh, people have gone to jail for smoothing earnings, which sounds to me like something very close to uh, uh, designing an accounting system uh, that's designed to hide the cyclicality. Um, uh, one way to deal with this, uh, if this were to go into effect, would be to elect fair value accounting. Uh, Mr. Blakely, so you, as I understand it, you can get out of all these rules and just go to another system of rules. Oh, what's the matter with that? Well, um, wow, that there You could are elect so that many... now, you could elect that later. Yeah, uh, the, the chairman... and, and, and I know your institution's pretty big and sophisticated. Uh, could a small bank implement uh, fair value accounting and just mark everything to market all the time? Uh, in, in the best of times, banks' ability to know the current fair value of an asset that doesn't trade is limited. Mm -hmm. You're using financial projections. In the worst of times, when you have a variety of different opinions, you see spreads or the difference between buyers and sellers and their view on what an asset is worth widen out considerably. And then if you have to make a bunch of estimates, you can smooth earnings, hide bad results from your shareholders, or be honest, but be accused of trying to smooth earnings or hide losses from shareholders. The more projections and estimates you make, um, the better it is for the trial bar. They need to sue somebody. Um, uh, but I want to go to the, uh, uh, Mr. Zandi, um, I can see a reason for reserves on the balance sheet. Have you looked at what this means for the income statement? Should we, uh, 
I mean, you, you put forward really what the perhaps the right answer is for the income statement might be too difficult to implement. And that is if you make 100 loans and two of them are going to go bad and 98 of them are going to be good and on those loans you're lending the money at seven and your cost of capital is three, so you're making pretty good money on the 98, you're losing money on two. If you recognize the loss on the two and you don't recognize the profit on the others, haven't you made things worse than not recognizing either? Well, look, I'm, uh, I'm very sympathetic to fair value accounting, very sympathetic to recognizing interest, income, and expense. I don't think, though, the, the banking industry and the rest of the financial system is to the point where they would go, want to go. You can hear it. And they don't want to go down that path. That's a very long road, maybe someday. But, but we have, we're just taking a baby step. If, the baby if, step is, look. If, you, if, you take a, if you're basically fair value is you go up and down. And what you're proposing is, well, do the down, but don't do the up. That no, would all, tend to give all, you a worse number. All I'm saying, all I'm proposing is we know on, when, we make, when we book loans and we have a portfolio right. of loans, we know the high probability because of historical experience that this percent is going to, to default, and we know the loss given default when But that you happens. also know so recognize with, that when with it the same kind of experience that the ones that don't default are going to be profitable. Yeah. The very fact that banks exist and haven't all gone bankrupt means that every time they, usually, when they make 100 loans, only two or three of them go bad, and the others are actually profitable. So this is you, very, from my you, perspective, know, the, this you is, know the profit on 97 loans just as much as you know the loss on the three loans. The only thing I'd say is, I, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I'd say is, I'm just, we're trying, in my view, solve for the following problem. We know the current accounting system is highly pro-cyclical. It messes things up in recessions. It, we saw it plain as day in the Great Recession. Let's just make this better. Yeah. I, let's, this is, I, this I just want to comment on Mr. Nelson's uh, answers to uh, Carolyn Maloney, and that is I think you will uh, inform the committee that whether this is less pro-cyclical or not it deserves additional study. That, a, that for us to come in and say, well, this is going to be less pro-cyclical because somebody did an analysis of its effect on uh, fixed rate 30 year prime mortgages. Uh, frankly, the financial system does, does a good job of making mortgages. I need money lent to businesses. And has a study been done on whether this is pro cyclical or anti cyclical or less pro cyclical with regard to the business loans that we're relying on banks to make? Well, certainly our study uh, estimated loan losses for all the different types of loans on the bank's portfolio. And then we used then information on the bank's portfolio of loans, the aggregate bank's portfolio of loans, to come up with the CECL analysis. So, and did your CECL analysis show that it made the thing more pro-cyclical or less pro-cyclical? It, it was much more pro-cyclical, uh, significantly more pro-cyclical, because banks, you know, it's... it's the, 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 this, thing, this thing needs more study. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, to go to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, and he's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having me here as your guest over from Capital Markets, and uh, it's uh, good to be able to shine a spotlight on this. I remember when uh, North Carolina Banking Association came in over a year ago and raised this issue with me, and uh, it's good to uh, have it in such a forum today. So thank you again, Chairman. So, Mr. Nelson, I'd like to uh, start with, with you and ask you a couple of questions. And some of this today from both sides of the aisle, it's been a, it, it'll be a, a bit of a summary. So if you could help pull this together towards the, the end of the afternoon here. So your research over at BPI, it found that Cecil would have a negative impact on lending uh, during a recession, the, the, the cyclicality issue we've been talking about with various members today. So in that vein, could you describe the impact and more specifically, what would happen to borrowers who are dependent on bank lending in a, in a recession? Uh, well, so in a recession, particularly borrowers that are dependent on bank lending are particularly uh, households that can't issue, uh, get loans that are securitized and packaged away. It's small businesses uh, as well. Um, and those borrowers are the ones that are going to, th those are the ones for which banks are going to have to particularly take significantly larger allowances as they mark down their outlook for the economy. Banks are going to, they will therefore reduce lending to those uh, individuals and those types of borrowers, and they will raise costs on those loans. So let's just continue. So uh, the, the Fed's vice chairman uh, for supervision, uh, Randall Quarles, said recently that a three-year phase-in of CECL would help the Fed understand any unintended consequences of adoption of CECL. Right. Sounds like a 
great idea, right? So, uh, but, but does that commitment really address your concerns uh, that CISA would have negative impacts on bank lending during a recession? No, it wouldn't. I mean, it's, so it's a good point. Uh, the the three-year phase-in is really only to let the banks have time to adopt CISL. It's not to let uh, everyone to observe what happens and then make changes to CISL. So the concerns that we've raised, the pro-cyclicality, the negative impacts for small business lending, student lending, uh, lending to households that don't have absolutely perfect credit scores, they'll all still be there. Mr. Steven, I've enjoyed your thoughts so far today. Would you, anything you would care to add to that regarding the uh, three-year phase-in? Um, when the Federal Reserve says they still don't have all of this fully implemented in their models, I think that reflects upon the, co the complexity. That's number one. But number two, I would very, I would very much like to address Congress, Congressman Sherman's question, which was an excellent question. If the Cecil model is so great, why is it you could choose not to do it and just go to fair value? That's what you said, which you are correct, sir. But let me bring this back home for you right now in your state. I've got a lot of great bankers I know in California. You've been devastated by these wildfires. You have, okay? If you believe in fair value, what would you tell me the fair value of a lot of the properties near and around those wildfires, they've obviously gone down. And I'm telling you, FV says go down, and the bankers are trying to run there and help their communities. It is a very pro-cyclical model. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, dare I say, uh, reclaiming my time? How about that? So, uh, uh, Mr. Nelson, um, just continuing on with a couple of other questions. Um, you know, historically, the, the FASB, which the SEC oversees, has been considered the world's preeminent accounting standard setter because of the rig rigorous process for developing the rules of the road for American companies. Well, with that said, I'm concerned that recent accounting standards like CECL, the forthcoming long-term duration standard for insurance companies, um, they have not been subjected to the kind of rigorous field testing and other due diligence that was applied prior to the financial crisis. So CECL, like the long-term duration standard, does not appear to have been sufficiently vetted uh, prior to becoming effective. That's one of the things we've talked about today. So in, in your view, would processes like comprehensive field testing or independent investor surveys uh, and cost-benefit analyses, would they give the SEC and the FASB the opportunity to identify and address problems with CECL that we're hearing about today? Yeah, absolutely, and, and the Bank Policy Institute wrote to the FSOC to encourage them to, ha to study further this, this problem. We recognize that this is a complex problem, and for the, we've asked the Fed to look into it. Further study is needed in order to understand the implications for the economy. Everyone agrees this is a major change, but we don't yet understand what the implications for the economy are going to be. It seems very likely that it's going to make business cycles worse. It's going to make the financial system even more of an amplifier of business cycles. And that should be understood before taking such a big change. Thank you, the whole panel. And with no time to reclaim, I yield back. Thank you. If the gentleman would like a little bit more time, we'd certainly be leaning toward that if you have a very short question. No, this is perfect. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, with that, we go to the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is recognized for five minutes. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you for doing this uh, hearing. It's good to have the panel before us of experts. We're grateful for your time. Following up on my friend uh, from North Carolina, uh, so that means that FASB doesn't follow the best practices that Chairman Luke DeMeyer laid out. So are we, are we saying that in this CECL proposal they did not do pre-issue field testing? Yes or no? To the, to the best of your knowledge. Mr. Nelson? Well, not to the best of my knowledge. And, and uh, they didn't do independent investor surveys to see how the market re would react to this to the best of your knowledge? I, I shouldn't say. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And then cost-benefit analysis, Mr. Stephen addressed. Do uh, you have anything you want to add on that? Uh, the FA, the, the FASB did talk to investors. Um, I was... Um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I don't remember the exact number that they did. But I can tell you of the investors who are true bank professionals, because this is a bank-specific model. Now, it, it, it implies all financial institutions, but primarily banks. There's not one bank 
specific investor that I know that supports this model. Thank you. So I've been in Congress four years. Before that, I was in the financial industry for 35 uh, years or so, including in the commercial banking industry. And in the four years I've served in the House, only two things have prompted a slew of phone calls into my office from community bankers. One was Treasury's beneficial ownership rule that was put out last May, and the other was Cecil. Uh, everybody else has kind of got their list of things they'd like to see improved along the way on Dodd-Frank, but these two have really struck a chord with community banks. And in looking at the uh, definitions, um, it says Cecil requires consideration not only past events and current conditions, of course that's what we have now, but also supportable forecasts that affected expected collectability. The standard does not mandate a specific technique for estimating credit losses, allows companies to exercise judgment to determine the methods appropriate for their own circumstances, and institutions are permitted to use loss estimation techniques already employed. So what, what's the point of this exercise would be a question I have. How are we that much better off? And if we could put up a slide, um, you know, you're asking community banks to make a forecast. And we've always used historic loss in setting loan loss reserves, rolling eight quarters, rolling 12 quarters, looking at uh, shocks in recession periods, shock in individual sector analysis. We do all this, and we've done it for decades. We've done it since double entry bookkeeping. But here's the Fed. They've got 700 economists. That's their starting point and their revision of their forecast for GDP. It's never right. And they have all the economists in the world, not as good as Mr. Zandi, but good. Let's go to the next one. Here's the Fed's forecast on inflation over here, but the actual is, it's never been right, not once. This is about a decade's worth of data. So how do we expect community bankers to forecast unknown events in the future when I don't see the measurable difference in, a, in transparency for loss analysis for the bulk of assets on a commercial bank's books by taking this standard, particularly when you read the standard and it says, institutions are permitted to use loss estimation techniques already employed, including loss rate methods, probability of default, discount cash flow methods, and aging schedules, meaning what we do right now. So if that's permitted right now, then I'm going to raise my hand at the board meeting when the senior vice president for credit administration comes in with this big gobbledygook proposal and say, hey, I like it, that's fascinating, but since you can't really tell me it's better, we'll just stick with what we're doing now. Is that permitted, Mr. Stephen? Can I just stick with what I'm doing now? Uh, from my understanding, that is not going to be permitted of sticking with what you're doing now. Uh, even if I'm a community bank and I don't have the Fed's wonderful ability to forecast, I'm, I still can't stick with what I'm doing now. Even if it demonstrates decade after decade that it's acceptable, that it actually is predictive of my actual losses? Again, on my understanding, including my time working with the FASB, I don't know if that would be acceptable. So maybe that's why Jamie Dimon suddenly after three years or four years of talking about this finds it concerning even for the largest, most sophisticated bank in the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman's time, uh, he yields back. Um, with that, uh, we have concluded our um, questions today and uh, we certainly uh, appreciate the witness's testimony. Just have a few uh, concluding thoughts here. Um, We've got actually a minute or two here, and what I usually try and do is give the witnesses all one minute to just sort of sum up some of your, if you had a question that you wanted to answer to, you didn't get a chance, or if you've got a comment you want to make to somebody else. But if you can hold it to one minute, because we're looking at probably getting going to the floor here and voting very shortly. So if we, Mr. Stephen, we'll start with you with one minute. Do you have anything you want to say, concluding remarks, summary? I would say that you and Congress have actually done a nice job along with the regulators, to improve the most important form of capital, which is tangible common equity, and that the United States banking regulatory system is in excellent shape. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Nelson? Thank you. And I'd say that I would want to add that we strongly support the objective of making the financial system less pro-cyclical. Unfortunately, you know, Congressman Hill put his finger precisely on the problem. Economic forecasts, including the forecasts of the Fed, forecasts of all of the professional forecasters, they don't ever predict 
uh, changes in the outlook for, that go from a downturn to an upturn or an upturn to a downturn. So even though, despite the best intentions, what CISA will do is it will cause loan losses to rise sharply when you go into a recession and fall, and fall and when you uh, are going into a recovery. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Blackley? Yes, just a couple quick comments. Um, first, I believe that Dodd-Frank and the post-crisis regimes are doing the job that they were built to do. We have a very well-capitalized banking system. CECL is redundant to that. It's harmful. I believe that there's you know, significant evidence that suggests that it's going to exacerbate an economic downturn. And given that, I believe that we need to change or eliminate CECL or adjust the capital regimes to reflect that fact. Mr. Zandi. Thank you the, for the committee for the opportunity to speak here and participate. It was a very uh, productive session, I thought. Uh, just one quick point. You don't need to take anybody's forecast. Uh, you can look at your historical experience, and that would be your forecast in the future. So it doesn't rely on my forecast. I, I, and believe me, I, I think I'm great at what I do, but I don't predict down uh, turning points very well either. But you don't need to rely on me, and Cecil's not designed to rely on those kinds of forecasts. Very good. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I just, I've got a few, a few thoughts and a few concerns that I want to voice here very quickly. Um, you know, Mr. Steven, you, you gave us some information here and I entered into the record with regards to your uh, serving on the committee that oversaw uh, this, the proposal of this rule. And in this, this, this discussion of uh, some of the papers uh, that you presented there, it was shown that the rule, as uh, Mr. Hill indicated as well, was not done according to FASB's own rules, which really begs the question, why? Why was it not? What's the concern? Who's trying to promote this? Uh, what's, who's behind this? What's really going on? Uh, it raises a lot of questions in my own mind. Uh, another thought, um, it was, all of you made the point that there's additional costs here to be borne by somebody, whether it's the, whether it's the banks or the consumers. Um, and so if that happens, uh, the point I made when we were discussing with FASB was, hey, look, if the costs have to be borne by the consumers, one of two things happen. Either they're, they're going to pay a whole lot more for this, or they're going to do without services. So if the banks uh, have to do without presenting them with additional services, which has happened with small dollar lending, which has happened with mortgage lending, there's more small, i got banks in my district no longer do mortgage lending. So suddenly now the banks have a CRA problem. They're not servicing their community. This is an unintended consequence of this, of this proposed rule in my mind. Um, so, and the other thing is, where, where does FASB think this money comes from that we're going to segregate out? The banks already have a loan loss reserve. So we're segregating out existing income, out of the existing year's uh, income. Is that where it's coming from? Is it coming from loan loss reserve? We're taking some of those reserves, setting them over to the side. We're taking out the capital. We're going to serve this side. Whatever it is, it's already money. It's already in a system that we're segregating out. That's already there. There's many, this is, this is, this is, this is a shell game of what they're trying to do with the money that's there for the capital reserves and income for the year. And it's nonsense in my mind. So I'm hopeful that we can, and also one other, one other comment that regard to Mr. Hill and the, uh, the comment he made with regards to the Fed economists, I've argued that point for a long time, but obviously FASB believes that the bankers, the community bankers especially, are better at estimating their, the local economy than the Fed and uh, everybody else is. So that's very heartening to know that. Um, Without that, um, I'd like to thank the witnesses again for their testimony today. Without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for the response. I ask our witness to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the, fair, to the chair for a conclusion, inclusion in the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.